You can check out our website at theerietouch.com for our source materials and reference photos for each episode. You can find this podcast on Spotify, Apple, and our YouTube channel. Be sure to follow us, The Eerie Touch, on Facebook for new leads and updates. And we would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to your podcast on. It would really help us out. Hey y'all, I'm your host Gabrielle. And I'm Kayla. Welcome to the Eerie Touch, where we dive into all things murder, mystery, and paranormal every week. The story that we're going to tell you today is like a scene out of a horror flick. A scene that includes a fridge full of questionable hog meat stored inside, a missing elderly couple, and the disappearance of a naval pilot son who may have ties to the CIA and is still unsolved till this day. All of this has left everyone asking the same question. Who put Fred and Edwina Rogers in the icebox? Now I want to like set the scene here for a minute, okay? Set for the time frame. It's the summer of 1965 in Houston, Texas. The sound of music had just hit theaters and kids were so excited to start their summer break. Astronaut Ed White had just made like the first U.S. spacewalk. So the 60s were hitting their peak, but for one family, it was a peak that they would never come down from. Marvin Melvin was a nephew to Fred and Edwina Rogers. Fred was an 81-year-old retired real estate agent, and Edwina was a 72-year-old who had worked in sales. Now, Marvin had a pretty close relationship with Edwina. He looked at her like a second mom, and they spoke pretty frequently throughout each week, so it was strange for Marvin when the last week of June hit and Edwina wasn't answering his calls. So on June 23rd of 1965, he ends up beginning to worry so much that he drives to the couple's house He knocks on the door a couple of times and no one comes. Now he just finds this completely odd and he tries to just like open the door but it's locked and he can't see inside through the windows because all of the blinds are drawn. Yeah but it is summer in Texas so I'm assuming it was really hot. Maybe they just had the blinds drawn to keep the heat from radiating through the windows. I mean that's that's a good point and that's very plausible I guess but Marvin didn't think so. All it did was cause panic to set in for him. So much so that he decides to call the police to perform a welfare check on his aunt and uncle. What is a welfare check? Um, a welfare check is like when the police go to check on the welfare of someone, like to make sure that they're okay and alive and not in need of any help or anything. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So two officers show up at 9 p.m. and knock on the door. They notice a car in the driveway, which later they discover is Fred and Edwina's 43-year-old son, Charles. Now, of course, no one answers the door for them either, so they start checking windows and making their way behind the house. Now, all the windows seem to have been locked, but when they make it out behind the house, they find that the back door is actually unlocked. So that's how they end up making their entrance. Now, once inside, they notice the house is a bit of a mess, really. Okay, so did they consider the mess could have been a sign of a struggle? Well, normally, that would raise some eyebrows, but Marvin told police that his relatives weren't the best housekeepers, so it was pretty normal for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after venturing into some of the rooms in the house, the police noted that it looked like, for the most part, everything was fine. There was a fan still on in one of the rooms, a TV was left on, and they even found Edwina's dentures lying on a side table. Well, maybe they just left to run down the road or something. Well, yeah, but I mean, do you really think that you would forget your dentures? Isn't that like just a go-to when you're leaving the house? Like keys? Check. Purse? Check. Are my teeth in? Check. <laughs> <laughs> True, but you know how I am. I can't tell you how many times I have forgot my debit card, purse, cell phone, and it's even gotten worse since I've been pregnant. Listen, people, pregnancy brain is a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I forgot my debit card and phone sometimes too, but I feel like forgetting your dentures is the equivalence to forgetting your car keys. Though you are not far from the same mindset police officers had. 
At this point, they were thinking that maybe Marvin had just had just missed them, all things considered. But when they were about to walk out, as they made their way into the kitchen, they noticed dinner was on the table, and it must have been for a while because it was moldy, like really bad. And not only that, but there was stuff like all over the kitchen. Oh, but didn't you say it was normal for them to be a little messy? How is it any different? Well, I did, but this was different. This this was a little strange or odd. Everything that you would expect to be in a refrigerator was sitting outside of it. Like there was condiments, milk, food, eggs, like leftovers all over the table, the countertops, and they were even in the floor. So naturally, they end up making their way to the fridge. Okay, I feel like this is the scene of a horror movie. One where you are screaming at the TV saying, No, don't go in there. (laughs) Your your intuition is always right, people. Because when they first open the fridge, they see that it's packed out with meat. We're talking every single shelf, drawer, and even in the freezer. Oh, goodness. What were they thinking? Because you know what I'm thinking. (laughs) Well, at first, the officers believe it's hog meat. They think that the Rogers must have just had a hog butchered and they may have went out to get a deep freeze for it. And I mean, you know, that seems normal, right? Like you just went and got a hog butchered and, you know, maybe you underestimated how much room it was going to take up in the fridge. So they go out and, you know, you go out and get a deep freeze. But right when one of the officers were about to close the door to the fridge, for whatever reason, he decides to check the crisper drawer. And he opens it in complete horror to find the head of Edwina staring right back at him. Mm. So he opens up the drawer next to hers and he ends up finding the head of Fred as well. See? See? I told you. (laughs) Don't open it. Oh, for sure seen out of a horror movie. The Amarillo Times stated, On all the shelves and in the freezer compartment were the dismembered bodies cut in unwrapped, washed-off pieces smaller than individual parts. Now, autopsies show that Fred had the more violent of the two deaths, and he was beaten to death with a claw hammer, his eyes were gouged out from his skull, and his genitals were removed, while Edwina had been shot in the left temporal lobe execution style. Damn. It's pretty obvious, at least to me, that Fred's murder had to be personal. Almost seems like overkill. I mean, that's a lot of hatred for somebody. While Edwina seems to have been quick, like all of the hate and energy was drained out on Fred. Oh, I agree. I think that we can at least say it's obvious who the main target was. So now the house has become a crime scene. And that very house was abnormally clean. They couldn't see any traces of blood or anything until they looked a little closer and was actually able to find traces of blood in the bathtub and the floor in the bathroom. It was determined that the bodies were drained and dismembered here. And investigators also noted that the toilet and pipes were stopped up. So some of the investigators actually end up crawling underneath the house and dismantle some pipes to figure out what was going on. And when they do... (sighs) Boy, were they surprised, people. Blood and organs end up gushing out of the pops. Ooh, that (laughs) makes me so sick to my stomach just imagining it. Did it drop on them? You know, I'm I'm not completely sure, but I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to guess here, people, that some probably did. I mean, they're crawling under a house. Yeah, I'm going to assume that it did. Because usually you don't have a lot of room to run under a house, especially if they were in a crawl space. Yes. Like, this scene out of Carrie looks different here. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> oh, okay. So, a 22 caliber pistol was discovered on a nightstand with the bullets, and tests came back positive for it being the gun that was used against Edwina. It's thought that maybe the killer um, decapitated her to remove the bullet, but, you know, a good amount of that bullet exited through her right cheek, and during the autopsy, bullet fragments were found. So that probably isn't true then, right? Yeah, that doesn't really make that much sense. But anyway, so in the kitchen was also found a toolbox that held a saw, hammer, and razor, which is all believed to have been used on the victims. Now, they also found the stairs to Charles's attic bedroom to be clean, but upon further inspection, they ended up finding some blood in the keyhole to his bedroom. 
In his room, officers accounted for a hot plate, kettle, and a collection of ham radios. What in the world is a ham radio? <laughs> Listen, girl, I was just as bamfuzzled as you. Like, at first, I literally thought that these were radios in the shape of a ham. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm an idiot. Now, if you're like us and you don't, you didn't really know or you don't know what a ham radio is, it's a radio that's usually used for non-commercial type of messaging like wireless experimentation, self-training, um, private recreation, and it's also used for emergency communication. And actually, since 1912, you have to have a license to have one, or at least you're supposed to, because of radio waves and how they're generated. So basically, because of safety, you need a license. But I'm going to assume those were used in the military too, weren't they? Yes, they are. Now, also in Charles's room, they find a bucket with bloody clothes and a raincoat, which they later believe he wore to dismember the bodies. So now, Charles has become their number one suspect. So it's not looking very good for Charles at this point. Mm -hmm. And you've yet to mention, where is he? Where the hell is Charles? Where has he been this whole time? Like, has police even got to question him? Well, see, that's the thing. That is the million-dollar question that no one knows the answer to. What do you mean no one knows the answer to? No one knows where he is? Yep. And they still, to this day, don't know where he is. You see, let me give you a little bit on Charles. A little backstory here. Charles Frederick Rogers was 43 years old. He was highly intelligent and had an interest, obviously, in ham radios. He was a pilot in World War II and also served in the Office of Naval Intelligence. He spoke seven different languages, and he even had a bachelor's degree in nuclear physics. What a resume. Oh, and I'm not even finished yet. It was said that he worked within the CIA or had some sort of relationship with them. When he was discharged from the Navy, he had worked for a Shell Oil Company for a little bit where he was a, I'm going to butcher this word because I told myself I was going to Google it <laughs> to figure out how to pronounce it, but obviously I forgot. So, a seismologist, which a are... seismologist. <laughs> Yeah, I can't say it either. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, like, basically, they're like our scientists, pretty much. And his boss described him as saying that he had the IQ level of a genius. Okay, so I get it. He was super duper smart and a naval man, which I'm going to stretch out on a limb here and say this is where his apparent love for ham radios came from. Bingo. I would say that you're on to something there. And in the 1950s, it was even said that he was involved in the Civil Air Patrol, where he met David Fury, a man who would later be involved in the plot to assassinate JFK. Mm. Uh -huh. After nine years of working for the Shell Oil Company, though, he just got up and quit one day with no explanation whatsoever. And it's when he's making this decision, he ends up moving in with his parents. Do they know why? Like, was his parents getting sick or something? I mean, I'm sure he made really good money. You would think him being a grown man, he would want to live in his own place. Oh, yeah. And things are fuzzy about that. Some accounts say that Charles actually owned half of his parents' house, and he paid off half their mortgage. Another version is that it was actually his home, and that Fred and Edwina were having money troubles, so they needed to live with him. Oh, see, that would make sense. Because if I had the money, like he did especially, I would want to help my parents if they needed it. Oh, yeah, I would too. So when Charles moves in, his personality ends up shifting. He becomes a loner and somewhat of a recluse. The findings in his room ultimately back that up too. I mean, police think that the hot plate and kettle uh, kind of foreshadowed that he probably stayed in his room the most that he could. Um, his bathroom was right beside of his bedroom, and they even found notes between Charles and his parents. It said they didn't even talk to each other hardly, and that they rarely saw him. They would just pass notes back and forth underneath the door if they needed to talk. And I just think that that is, like, that is so weird. weird. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. So in the rare instance that he would have to speak to someone, everyone said that he would only speak to his mom. Hmm. So Fred was overkilled, and Charles obviously favored his mom, which could be obvious with the way she was murdered if you're going to say he was the culprit. That's right. And evidence is piling up and pointing towards him. Well, so far, he seems like a very strange man. Oh, honey. And it gets even more strange. Charles sometimes did leave the house, but he only would leave at dawn. And he would not come home until it was completely dark and most people were already asleep, especially when his parents were already asleep. Um, well, then what in the hell was he doing? <laughs> See, that's the thing. is absolutely no one, no one can account for what exactly he was doing during all of that time. Masterminding a plan to take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or masterminding a plan to murder his parents and get away with it. Oh, now that's dark. Mm-hmm. Well, the coroner, the coroner believed that whoever was responsible had to be someone experienced with anatomy because the cuts were pretty neat. But I don't really know... <laughs> I don't really know how much of a difference that would make because, I mean, you can be a hunter, and if you know how to butcher meat, you know, like if you butcher your own meat, then you're used to the joints. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so he also determined that the couple had been dead for about three days, which would mean that they were murdered on Father's Day. Well, talk about a twisted Father's Day gift. (laughs) You ain't lying. Naturally, there was this huge manhunt for Charles that went on after the discovery of the bodies. Some neighbors were shocked to have even found out that Fred and Weena had a son because he was never seen and hadn't ever been spoke about with them. Like, who doesn't talk about their children with their neighbors in some shape, way, or form? Okay, now hear me out. For one, we just said... He never came out of his room. He was mm-hmm. even passing notes to his parents to communicate with them. Yeah. And if you weren't really close to your neighbors, then why would you bring up a kid that's locked up in their room 90% of the time? Well, yeah. I, I, yeah, but I mean, you would just think, though, that after living there for years, that at some point they would have mentioned it. I mean, the neighbors and people that lived in the community said that Fred and Edwina were very involved in that little community. Okay, I will give you that it's weird that they never seen Charles, but do you talk to all of your neighbors? Well, no. Exactly. I'm just saying, is it weird to a degree? Yes. Can I understand how or why it wouldn't have been brought up? Also, yes. Well, I guess, but I still think it's really weird. So, what about Charles? I know earlier you said he was never found, but did they ever find a clue or a trace of him? Nope, not at all. But they did find some red flags. You see, while they were trying to track Charles, they discovered that in the past, he had applied to some jobs under false names, and they had a god-awful time trying to find his pilot license, because when they did end up finding it, it was under a different name. So it's obvious now that something something was definitely going on. Oh, most definitely. Do they know why, though? Well, not necessarily, but I'll touch on that one in a minute. Now, searching for him went on for a while until a judge actually had him legally declared dead in July of 1975 so they could have the estate probated. Well, what did they want with the estate? <laughs> what, what every... What every, I guess, I feel like politician or like local government wants to do. They want more money, I'm assuming, because the house never sold. And it ended up being demolished. And then sometime in the 2000s, uh, there was a condominium that was built on the property. So they stopped the manhunt after some time because it was leading nowhere. And they had no clues as to where he went. So pretty much they just, I think they just had him legally declared dead because they wanted that land. Because with everyone dead, if they sold the land, then the money from the land would go to, like, the state or the county, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But what happens if he wasn't the murderer? Is it too crazy to think that maybe he was a victim as well? I don't think it's too crazy to think that, but I don't think that the investigator spent too much time dwelling on the what if of that scenario. The, the amount of evidence that they had against him was just too overpowering to dismiss. And when questions went unanswered, 
theories arose. In 1992, John P. Craig and Philip Rogers wrote a book about Charles called The Man on the Grassy Knoll. Now, both authors worked as investigators for the National Intelligence Service Bureau, and they claim that Charles was actually a CIA agent until the mid-1980s. Mmm, well, you know, if he was, that could explain why he had so many different aliases. I mean, doesn't the CIA agent train to leave no trace? Mm Mm-hmm. You would think so. The authors even go so far as to link him to the assassination of JFK. Wow. That, mm mm-hmm. They accuse him of impersonating Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico City and bring up the fact that he was accused of being one of the three tramps, along with Charles Harrelson and Chauncey Holt, who were arrested in Dilly Plaza after the assassination. And their reasoning as to why he murdered his parents were because they knew too much on him. That they had been listening in on his super secret CIA agent phone calls. Wait, what? Would the CIA really be that ignorant to have contacted him on his home telephone number like that? Wouldn't you think they had like a more personal and direct way of talking to him? Like maybe through those ham radios? Exactly. Mm hmm. That's what I was leaning towards too, girlfriend. More so, at least, than the landline. But the man on the grassy knoll has been heavily criticized because of their lack of sources and that it was just like blatantly fictionalized. So they couldn't back anything up that they were speculating. Apparently so. Anyway, so Craig and Philip aren't the only ones who have wrote books expressing their opinions. In 1977, forensic accountant Hugh Gardner and his wife Martha wrote a tell-all book, The Icebox Murders. Now, they too claim that maybe the CIA had something to do with all of this, but they don't think that he was an agent. They think that he just had dealings with the CIA. Martha and Hugh speculate that Charles murdered his parents because they were abusive to him and had been for years. They state that Fred and Edwina had been frauding Charles, that they were forging his name on loans and land deeds and... They even try to claim that Fred was an active gambler in debt and had been stealing huge sums of money from his son. And because of his super powerful friends in the CIA and military, he was able to flee and disappear to Mexico. So, it seems like both books have similarities in their opinions. Is there any truth to back them up, though? Well, somewhat, yeah. The couple didn't seem to have a ton of money, so it is plausible that Charles may have lived with his parents to help them. It's also true that he didn't get along with his father, you see. It's hardly ever mentioned anywhere online. I actually couldn't find this brought up in hardly any news articles from back in the day about Charles having a sister. Whoa, wait. He had a sister? So where was she during all this? Was she ever questioned? Well... Unfortunately, she hadn't been around in some time. Betty Rogers hadn't been with them since 1929. In 1929, the Rogers were actually on a family vacation with some other friends of theirs when a deer runs out in front of the car. Now, Fred, angry or frightened, we don't really know, but one of the two, he screams at the driver, which causes the driver to wreck the vehicle. Now, Betty ends up passing away in the accident. Other members of the Roger family claim that Charles always blamed his father for the death of his sister, and their relationship was never the same after that. So, this could be where the hatred of Fred comes from, and Edwina was just somehow caught in the middle of her son and her husband. Oh, that's so sad, but insightful. This could be the proof that we need to pin it on Charles. Fred was not only murdered passionately, but having his genitals removed and his eyes gouged out show a more sadistic and deeply rooted hatred for this man. As Edwina being a more quick and what I would hope painless murder, he showed more mercy for his mother, it seems like. Yeah. That, that's what I was thinking, too. I mean, I can understand wanting to blame your father for the death of your sister, but I don't think murder was the answer to their problems. Mm. He could have simply just moved away and never spoke to them again. Okay, murder is never really the answer. And it's hard to understand why someone would feel like they only had the option to kill to find a way out. But it happens all the time. That it does. Now, there's 
no hard evidence to back up that he was in or working with the CIA. But then again, if you were involved or with the CIA, would there be any evidence? Because I don't think so. I don't think so either. I mean, that's the whole point of being in the Secret Service is to be a secret. (laughs) Obviously. On another weird note, though, Edwina's brother paid the funeral expense for both her and her husband. Okay, but why is that weird? Well, that's not. But what's weird is that their tombstone has no birth or death dates, nor any names on it. All it says is Rogers, and we do have a picture of it up on our website if you want to check it out, along with some of the crime scene photos and pictures of everybody that's involved. But anyways, so there's no names or anything. But they are, they buried in the same plot together along with their daughter, Betty. Hmm. Okay, now that is a little weird. But hear me out on this one. What if Edwina's brother didn't put any names on the tombstone in case Charles was to come back and try to do something with the bodies again? I mean, he did take the time to brutally chop them up and they were dismembered. Maybe he was afraid of what Charles might do. If he was the murderer... Is there a possibility that he was meaning to come back since the fan and TV was left on? He may have tried to come back and saw police and the house taped off. So he just ran because his original plan was totally thrown off. I know it's far-fetched. It's something you should think about. Oh, no. Like, that that can be a really good one, actually. But, I mean, you would just, you would think that Charles knew where his sister was buried already, so. Well, yeah, that's true. And they usually put where you're laid to rest in your obituary. Yeah. But now the returning part. Now, I could believe that one. I mean, a lot of murderers usually return to the scene. So, who knows what Charles really had in store for them afterwards. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just something to ponder. And that is exactly what the world has been left to do. Ponder. There has been no arrests made in the murder of Fred and Edwina Rogers. There has been no other suspects other than Charles named. So we are left with two questions after all of these years. Where the hell is Charles Rogers? And who put Fred and Edwina Rogers in the icebox? Again, I'm your host, Gabrielle. And I'm Kayla. We'll talk next week.